Again, I'm just so thankful for Sam and Zoe and for their story and just the way that God led them to um, those care groups and the role that that played. And, and again, um, you know, I just want to I want to normalize the reality that there are times in our life when we all need somebody to walk alongside of. Um, we, we don't ever want to be a place where the expectation is we come in and pretend like we've got our act together. Right. We can come in some pretty uh, genuine, messed up places because I speak from experience and, and, and we need people around us to, to remind us of so much of what Sam and Zoe just, just told us. And so um, you can look on our app uh, online or out at the welcome desk. We'd love to share more about our care groups and, and other ways that we can journey um, alongside of each other in community through the, through the great seasons of life and sometimes through really difficult seasons of, of life. Um, and I'm thankful that that, that exists uh, and we're a place that, that offers that. So, um, and many of you know that over the years, um, I have talked about the various missions trips that I've been a part of. And, Ones I've led as a pastor, others this summer I was in Ecuador, I think I mentioned this before, with my oldest daughter, and I just got to be there as, as a volunteer leader and as a, as a dad. It was a, an amazing experience, and I loved that, that time together. And one of the, the things that happens there regularly, and that I love about it, is, is in the evening they get together around what they call team time. Um, in fact, this is just a picture from, from this year's Ecuador group sitting around the fire, there'd be worship there, and, and we talk about what we read in the morning and lessons that we were learning. And one of the elements of team time um, pretty regularly is they would do some form of intentional encouragement. So for instance, in Ecuador, they take like this, this staff, this hiking staff, and the students will, um, will take it and they'll hand it to another student. When they hand it to the other student, they say to them some way, some manner in which they saw Christ in them that day. So whether it was on the work project and when everybody was wearing out and the, the kid that just stood up and said, hey guys, we can do this, let's push through, let's finish strong. Another student might have seen that and said, you know what, that encouragement was exactly what I needed and thank you for, for representing Jesus to me today. And somebody else might talk about it and say that, hey, when we were um, reading our devotions this morning and you just um, pointed out that verse, I just, I want you to know, like, that really meant a lot to me, and I'm thankful that you were willing to, to do that, and different things, and one of the things that, that I saw over the years was that oftentimes when they would come in as freshmen, so the, the, the teams still do this, it, it would be, it would be um, kind of a learned ability. Um, oftentimes when they would start practicing this in community, it would start with humor, right? It would, they would say something funny about the other person. And, and it could be nice, it could be genuine, but, but over the course of their time throughout high school ministry and Tom and Gretchen and our, our adult leaders, they model this to the kids. They learn to really speak some really profound and powerful truths into each other's lives. And it doesn't always go perfectly. It's not... But, but it really became cool as the kids matured to watch their ability and their capacity to use their words to build each other up. And one of the things that I discovered in watching all of this unfold was that it's so incredibly rare. Like that there's so few environments that we have in life where somebody's looking at us and specifically identifying and speaking some way that we've modeled Christ and how that, that encourages them. And so this morning, when we're talking about this spiritual discipline, as we have each and every week this summer, we're going to talk about how we speak words of blessing to each other. And my, it's my belief that this is one of the disciplines that we're going to look at that I, I think has the greatest capacity for sort of instant impact. Not only in our own experience as we practice it and as we grow in a deeper and fuller understanding of grace, but really in, in those who receive it as well, in our culture as a whole, our community, and in our families, our workplaces. Um, it, it's no secret, right? You'd have to be living under a rock not to know that, that culturally our, our rhetoric has become somewhat uh, critical, that it's, it's oftentimes very polarizing and mean. Right? Sometimes just, just plain mean, and we all want to point fingers at who's to blame and where this 
rare this resides, and it, it can be demoralizing and, and discouraging. One author that I read who's talking about this has said, so often so many of us walk around feeling more cursed than we do blessed. But in an environment where, where so often our, our words can be so toxic, and, I, and I, I am a part of this, I'm not, this is me too. In an environment where there can be so much toxicity around how we use our words, uh, on the opposite of that, speaking words of encouragement or speaking words of, of blessing can have an incredible impact in, in our culture and in the world around us. I think we as, as a church have an opportunity here because this sounds so different than so much of what we hear on a regular basis. I wanna begin by, by just working, looking at a definition. So when we talk about the idea of speaking blessing, like what, what does that mean? What does this look like? This, this definition comes from Adele Calhoun in her work, um, The Spiritual Disciplines Handbook, which I've used a couple times this summer, but this is how she describes this practice. She says, to bless and encourage others is to speak well of them, inspiring them with God's own hope, confidence, and delight in their belovedness, which we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit, that phrase, delight in their belovedness. So again, as we have all summer long, my goal in this is just to sort of deepen our understanding of this practice and what does it mean to, to speak blessing and to speak encouragement into each other's lives and then talk about how do we integrate this? How, how do we practice this? So we're going to turn to, to the book of James, James chapter 3. So um, I will add the, the caveat here. Um, James is, as oftentimes we've talked about before, he's a very blunt sort of guy. Like he just says things in a very straightforward manner. So you know like how sometimes like a sermon, it's like we're unpacking some historical context to, that kind of like makes the passage come alive sort of thing. Like we're not, we're not doing that today. Like James, is, he's obvious, he's overt in what he wants to say. And so um, we're gonna look at just a couple things that James um, says about how we use language and words. And, and the other thing to understand is James is actually gonna approach this from the negative perspective. So he's going to talk about how destructive it can be when we use our words in a way that's harmful or hurtful. Um, but I think we can draw some correlations between what happens positively when we use it in the opposite direction. So we're gonna begin by looking at the source of blessing and we're gonna look at James chapter three, beginning in verse two. James says, okay, we all stumble in many ways. So that's, that is a great way to begin, right? So he acknowledges at the outset, we're all messed up. Let's, let's understand that. And then he says, anyone who is never at fault and what they say is perfect. So he's saying that person doesn't exist, able to keep their whole body in check. And he goes on, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the body parts. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. So like I said, James can be a little like, uh, I'm going to tell it like it is kind of guy, which is good. We need that sometimes. But he's approaching this whole idea of language from the destructive side of things. He says all, of, all animals or all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and Sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? 
My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. I, um, when we're talking about this idea of source, I don't, I don't, I'm not like an economics kind of guy. I don't, I don't live in that world um, very much. And, and yet, um, I have friends who are. One of the things that I've learned over the years that, that people who are studying the markets and trying to understand economic trends, that one of the things they look for are what they call lead indicators. And a lead indicator is a marker or a, a, a forecast into what likely is going to happen a month or three months or six months from now. So they'll, they'll take and they'll look at things like um, the, the amount of sale orders for in manufacturing or the amount of average hours worked in industrial plants or they'll take things like the application numbers for unemployment and they'll look at all these things and it's, it's meant to help them understand the overall economic health that, that is behind the scenes. Or what's, again, to say differently, sort of what is at the, the source? See, this is what James is, is helping us understand about the words that we use. He's saying that this, this is a lead indicator of, of, of the condition of our heart. It's an outward indication of an inward reality. So, so according to James, one of the marks of a transformational work of the gospel in our lives is what comes out of our mouth. Can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring, he asks. It's ironic that oftentimes one of the most common criticisms levied at, at Christians and the church is that we're, we're all talk, right? It's all about what we say and that our actions don't reflect the same truths that we, that we claim and that we proclaim. And, and that accusation is absolutely fair at times. There's times when I can say that that has been true in my own life, and it can, I can say it's been true sort of in the corporate experience of who we are. We have to confess that, acknowledge that. We don't want to pretend like it doesn't exist. But James is not, he's not advocating that what it means to be a follower of Jesus is talking a good game. In fact, on, on the contrary, he, he's already said in the previous chapter that faith by itself, when not accompanied by action, is dead. So, so James is not about making sure that we, we, we talk a good game here. He's teaching us that, that our words are a reflection of what's at the source. That it's, that it's and he gets into this specifically. He says it's, it's hypocritical to stand up and sing and pray and worship and have all of this out of one side of our mouths and then simultaneously demean and belittle and tear down our brothers and sisters, who he says, he points out, are made in the image of God out of the other side of the mouth. He says, in no uncertain terms, brothers and sisters, this, this should not be. See, the point that I, I, I want us to think about when we're talking about this practice of blessing and encouragement is that it finds its source we're speaking out of a transformational encounter with grace. And the reason that I, I mention this is sometimes the idea of, of blessing or blessedness, like in our culture, it can become almost like trivialized a little bit, right? Like it's a hashtag, right? When we're on vacation, oh, blessed, right? This is, we use this. Not that that's a bad thing. That actually can be an experience of blessing. That can be a good thing, but he's saying that's not the ultimate source from which we understand what it means to be blessed. What it means to be blessed is the realization and awareness of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. That we've received that and understood that. Everything else is, is, is just sort of a shadow. It's, it's an it's a inferior image of a, of a greater reality. So James roots the power of, of the words that come out of our mouth uh, in an experience with the grace of Jesus that leads us from death to life. He, James is rooting this practice of our words, our blessings, our encouragement, and in our salvation. See, to, so to speak from anything that is sort of circumstantial is, is, is an inferior motivation for us to speak from. Um, Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians, he, 
He says this, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and he's writing to the church here. I think he makes this point really well. This is in verse 9 now. He says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about this experience with grace that we have. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, so as a result of this, encourage one another. Therefore, because this is true, because you've had this encounter with grace, build one another up, just, as it, just in fact as you are doing. See, he's saying that at the source of this, where this originates in us is an encounter with grace. It's, it's the transformative work of Jesus that's moved us from, from spiritual death to life in him. That, that, that is the source of, of speaking blessing in each other's lives. But the second point that, that James makes, and I think, again, makes very overtly, is just simply the power of blessing. The power of blessing. I can remember two, two conversations, two experiences in, in middle school that, that I still recall vividly to this day. I've told you before, middle school was not my peak season of life. Like, I was a, a late bloomer, so to speak. And, and um, I remember being on the basketball team, so I was, like, I was like the last guy on the team, you know, like just sort of there to bring in the water cooler at the end of practice kind of guy. <laughs> and I was on the bus ride home after practice. We had practiced at one school. It was taking us back to another. And... and, um, and I remember these guys in the back of the bus, and uh, these cool guys, <laughs> as I called them, um, and they kind of ushered me back. So I was like, oh, okay. You know, I could go back there, and, and one of the, the guys, who's one of the best players on the team and that sort of stuff, starts to invite me to a party that weekend. He's like, hey, do you want to come? And I'm like, I can't believe this is happening right now. Like, what is going on? And it goes on and on. I'm kind of getting excited about it. And like midway through the conversation, I realize it's a joke. That, that he is being funny around the other guys by, that it would be hilarious that I would be invited to this party, right? Like, and I remember feeling that. I remember being like, joke's on you. I'm, I'm awesome at a party, so, <laughs> like. But you carry that, right? Like, you carry those moments. You carry that hurt. You carry that embarrassment of sort of, like, walking back to the front of the bus where you realize, like, okay, like, the actual just invitation of me is, like, funny to these guys. Like, like that hurts. But then at the same time, I, I remember being on this youth retreat up in uh, Upland, Indiana, just outside of Taylor University there, and there's a little sort of um, um, retreat center there, and we were doing my fall retreat with the youth group, and my youth pastor said, hey, I want you just to kind of like, I want you just to share a little thought or a verse or something before we go to breakfast. So I was like, okay, I have no idea what I said or anything like that. And I just remember um, later that day when we were walking over to this Ivanhoe's place to get ice cream, if you know Taylor, and walking over there, and he just kind of like came up beside me and just said, hey, I, I just wanted to tell you, I don't, when you were doing that this morning, like you just seemed like you were in your element. Like you just seemed like that you were, that there was something about it that you really enjoyed, that it just seemed like maybe that God is, is, wired you for something like that. He wasn't, he's like, I'm not trying to tell you you're going to be a pastor or you're going to follow in my footsteps, anything like that. I just wanted you to know that about yourself. And I remember that. Like, I remember, I mean, I can still picture the walk with him and being like, huh. Like, you know, now that he says that, like, I, I kind of felt that way. I kind of felt like that maybe I was wired for that. And what does that mean? And how does that look? Because he took the time to speak that into me. Now, we, we look at these two instances, same season of life, just a middle school, middle school kid trying to figure out how to get by. One that 30 years later, I can still look at and be like, man, that hurt. Like, that stunk. And, and then one, like, 30 years later, I look at and be like, you know what, that helped, that helped direct me in, in the trajectory that my life was going to take. Like James's point here is that our words are powerful. In fact, he starts this whole thing with three illustrations. If you look back in, in James, verse 3, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. 
Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great, a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. James says, look, your, your words are critically important. They're powerful. Like, understand the, the impact that they have. And again, James is approaching this from the negative. Look at the damage that can be done. But we, I think it's fair to apply this conversely as well. Look how much power you have to be constructive and to build up and to shape with your words and your language. Again, uh, Adele Calhoun addresses this um, in her book. She talks about the, the power of our words and the power of speaking blessing. And she writes, when we are blessed or literally to speak well of and encouraged, we're better able to internalize our value, worth, and dignity. Without life-giving words, we fail to thrive emotionally and physically. When, when blessing and encouragement go missing, the evil one plants lies about how worthless or stupid or fill-in-the-blank we are. And when lies metastasize, they poison the joy and delight of being alive. The author of Proverbs says it succinctly and poignantly in, in Proverbs 18, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. See, James, James' point as he's writing to the early church here is that our words are powerful. They can be powerfully destructive when targeted to hurt and, and to tear down, and they can be incredibly um, um, formative when they are spoken with truth and love. So again, to me, I, I think in the cultural season that we are living in, in this cultural mo moment, we as the church have an incredible opportunity to speak life. Leslie Newbegin um, once wrote, he says, we must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. I love, I love that quote. I think, I think that's so well written. But I think it would be fair, and Newbegin would be okay with us just adjusting that slightly and saying we must speak in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. Our words are powerful. The call to and practice of speaking words of blessing and encouragement is life-giving both to you and I as we offer it, both as we speak it to others and to the one who is receiving it. There's, for both of us, there's an encounter with grace there. Which brings us then thirdly to the practice of blessing. And I, and I wanna just, so oftentimes, we talk about something like this, at least in my faith journey, there'd been times when I would hear about this and I would think, you know what, that's better left to the professionals, right? Even that term blessing, we kind of think it's like churchy and pastoral and so we'll, we'll let the people with the degrees do this kind of thing. And I, I really want us to adjust our understanding of what we're talking about here so that we, I believe that we need to make this practice normative in the life of the church and in our own lives, our families, our workplaces, and, and, and the people that we do life with. In part because I think one of the most powerful experiences that I've ever had of, of blessing didn't come from somebody with a degree in theology or, or a pastoral title. It just came from a dad who was talking to his son. I'm totally gonna cry, just FYI, so brace yourselves. Um, when I've told you the story of, of my dad and when he was um, coming to the very end of his life, like um, knew that his, his days were short. Um, he, wanted, he wanted to gather us together as a family just to talk and plan through his service and what he wanted to be a part of. And at this point in time, like the pancreatic cancer had caused congestive heart failure. So his lungs were full of fluid Breathing was incredibly difficult and talking was, was pain, like you could hardly do it. And so we're, we're walking through this and it was difficult and, and 
and you're trying to just, I don't even, how do you have this conversation, right? With the person sitting right there in the room and we're just trying to navigate our way through this. And as we came to the conclusion of that time, my, dad's, my dad kind of whispered something to my mom and he just said, I wanna pray over each one of my boys. And so each one, I was 35 years old, you know, grown man, sitting at my father's feet with my head in his lap. I can still hear his voice gurgling as he tried to speak the words, but just saying like, praying a prayer of blessing, praying, praying his desire for his son. It's, it's that I would follow Jesus in my life, that I would that I would love my wife with all my heart, that I would raise my kids to know Jesus, and that one day in heaven that he would be there surrounded by his kids and his, his daughter-in-laws and his grandkids, and that we would just be worshiping Jesus together. And every word was pained and it was difficult, and yet it was formative in my life to hear this, this person who did, again, was a follower of Jesus, but didn't have a degree in theology and didn't just speak his desire for, for me and what he wanted me to experience and what that would look like. And, and here's what I want you to understand. We, we think about how do we practice this? What does this look like? I would just, I wanna leave you with a couple things that I both received and I think we see throughout the pages of scripture that help us understand how we do this. What does this look like to do this well? And the first thing I would tell you, is you speak words of identity. Speak words of identity. There's another, there's a beautiful passage in, in the book of Mark that is a blessing. And it's also a blessing between a father and a son. And Jesus is just about to launch his ministry. And, and as he does so, he goes to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. And as he's coming out of the water, this is in Mark chapter 1. Verse 10 and 11, it says that the, the heavens opened up and the spirit came down as a dove. And then God says this in verse 11. He says, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So what I love about this is Jesus hasn't even launched his ministry. He hasn't healed anybody. He's not casting out demons. He's, he's just getting started. There's nothing about performance or accomplishment he hasn't risen from the dead yet. It's relational. He reminds him of his identity, who he is. You're my son and I love you. Now if you fast forward, I'm gonna skip the Galatians passage, 2 Corinthians chapter six. Paul writes this to the church there. He says, and I will be a father to you, speaking of God, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So again, Here's what you need to understand. We're talking about speaking words of encouragement. This, these words that he said over his son, he now says that you are co-heirs with Christ through what he accomplished on the cross. And so when he talks about your identity, who you are, he's saying you are my son and daughter. We need to remind each other of that. We, we, need, we need moments where we speak that into each other's life because so easily for me, it becomes about approval and performance. And I adapt those and those stink as identities, because they're so fleeting and they're so temporary. But you are the son and daughter of the created God who says, I love you. We speak blessing when we remind each other of that. The second thing is, is speak truth. Speak words of truth. This, is, this encompasses a lot. But moments when we remind each other that we were created for a purpose, when, when we see that and tell each other that, when we say to each other, hey, like, you are uniquely gifted, when we talk and remind each other that we're unconditionally loved, that we're valuable, remember James says you're created in the image of God, that we are new creations, that our, our past does not get to define us, that we've been transformed and that we've been called. One of the ways to practice this, especially when you think about outside of, of the church or outside of people that might also be followers of Jesus, one of the ways that you can do this in your workplace or in your neighborhood is just gratitude. Anytime that you see somebody, your neighbor mows your lawn when you're on vacation, you know, you can go up and say, hey, thanks for mowing my lawn, but you can also just say, hey, thanks for taking the time and energy. That was, that was so kind of you. Like you're pointing to that part of them that reflects that they're an image bearer. 
You're, you're pointing to a quality in them that, that, that reflects that. We can, we can do this in, in ways that is receivable in our culture. And then thirdly and finally, speak words of hope. Speak words of hope. And, and, and this is when we, we speak words to each other. Is this, is, this is what I want for you. I think we most clearly see this in almost every letter Paul writes. And he writes to the church, and he often does it in, in the context of a prayer. He'll say, this is, this is what I pray for you. In fact, if you flip real quickly to Ephesians chapter 3, this is one of my favorite examples of this. This is, this is he's praying it, but these are words of blessing over this early church. He says, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being. This is what I want for you, he's saying to the church, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, I want that you would be rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, right? Paul is saying, this is what I want for you. This is, this is one of the things I remember so distinctly about my dad's words. He talked about me and he offered that, that blessing through those, those gurgled words was, I want, you, I want you to follow Jesus. I want you to, to live this out. I, wanna, I want you to teach this to your kids so that they know and understand this is what I want for you. See, these are the things that, that we need to hear from each other. And we, we can do this. We can say this. This isn't one of the things that we, we don't need to leave this to the, to the pros, right? Because one, we mess it up way too much. And two, there's too many of us. We have to be able to speak these words to each other, words of identity, words of truth, and and words of hope that remind us who, who God says that we are and what he wants for us. So our challenge this week is, is simple. I want you to, five days this week, I want you to look, no, I don't want you to look for it. I want you to write or speak a word of encouragement or blessing to somebody in your life. Again, you can start where it makes most sense to you. If it's a family member, a spouse, or a kid, just... I want you to just say, hey, I, this, I see this in you, or just be reminded today, you're my daughter, but beyond being my daughter, you are a daughter of the Almighty King. Like, live in that reality today. Like, five days this week, speak truth. And then at the end of the week, when you're, maybe you've kind of warmed up a little bit, look for an opportunity sort of outside of that, this makes sense zone. Like, look for an opportunity with a coworker, or a neighbor, or another parent on on the sports team. And again, you don't have to make this weird. It doesn't have to be churchy. But anytime that you're pointing out a quality in them that it reflects that they're a child of God, we're speaking words, words of blessing in their lives. And so as we wrap up today, I just want to practice it for a second. Um, I was thinking as, as this time of year and my kids and, and all of our kids are just getting launched into school and my wife and I were talking about just what an amazing experience my kids have had, how many great teachers they've had. And, and so if you are a teacher, an educator, a, a, a social worker, a, if you work in the school system, public or private in any fashion, I want you to stand real quick. Would you stand up? Yeah, thank you. Okay, one, can I just tell you how grateful I am for you people? You guys do an amazing job influencing our kids. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to weird you out real quick. Is that okay? I should have asked you that before I made you stand. Would you mind coming down here and standing here? I, I want to just pray a blessing over you guys. Because what you do is important and you're investing in the lives of our kids. And we as a community are so grateful for, for what you guys do. Um, and so, church, I'm going to pray. Would you pray um, along with us as we pray for the men and women um, who, who serve in our school system so effectively and so passionately? Let's pray a blessing together. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for these men and women. We thank you for the work that you've called them to, to, to educate and to serve the students and children of our community. God, we pray peace and covering over them over this, this whole year. 
where we know that you have great things in store for them. And so we ask your blessings over them. And we pray that this would be a, a year that is defined by your work and activity in their lives. Jesus, we ask for wisdom and grace that you would equip each of them each day to do the work that you've prepared for them. Lord, give them strength and give them a heart of compassion and grace that comes to them in each interaction that they have with a student or a teacher or a parent. Fill them with creativity and passion to fulfill the call that you have placed in their lives. Lord, when they're tired and worn out and feel unappreciated, Lord, I pray that you would surround them. Lord, that you would bring people into their lives to speak words of encouragement and blessing. Lord, remind them that, that they are able to do so much more each day through you as you give them strength. Lord, remind those who lead and teach and serve in our schools in whatever capacity that, they, that you have given them an incredible opportunity to impact the life of a child every single day. So God, go before them. Be with them. Bless them and watch over them. Remind them that far more than representing a job or a school or a district or any of that, they represent you. Surround their families and their personal lives with your care and your protection. Provide for them. Lord, speak into every concern and anxiety, reminding them that you are able to do all things. Love through them. Shine your light over them. Pour out your blessing and favor upon them throughout this year. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand with me? And I'll offer this morning's benediction. Let's thank these teachers, by the way, real quick, before we... <laughs> Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, who, um, who has given us our identity, who has spoken profound truths into our lives, and is our hope. May we speak this to each other, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.